Hello and welcome to Devil's Advocate. After Nandi Gram, is the government still committed to SEZs and does it believe the time has come to permit large corporate houses and FDI into the retail sector? Those are the two issues I shall raise today in an exclusive interview with the Minister of Industry and Commerce, Kamal Nath. Minister, let's start with SEZs. It's reported that the empowered group of ministers could be considering giving permission to those SEZs where there is no land acquisition issue to go ahead. Do you believe after Wednesday's events in Nandi Gram that could still be the case? You said it, Karan, where there are no land issues. Nandi Graham was a land acquisition issue. It's nothing to do with an SEZ. So where there is no land issue, there's no issue of land acquisition, uh, the uh, group of ministers would consider uh, such cases. And you're hopeful that this will be the case? They will consider it? They won't get put off for political reasons? Well, of course, there is a fear now where land acquisition is concerned, where land uh, is in dispute. But where there's no land in dispute, why should we... Uh, one be uh, worried about so it. So you remain an optimist on this? I'm an optimist, of course. The Indian Express has already reported that so far because of delays in giving clearance, up to a thousand crores of investment has been lost to India because foreign partners have pulled out of proposed SECs. Are you worried that if for political reasons or for fear, the empowered group of ministers don't give clearance as you're hoping, that figure of a thousand could grow sharply? Of course I'm worried because there is the investment competitiveness from Thailand, from Philippines, from Indonesia. If uh, FDI is coming into our special economic zones, they can jolly well go to Thailand and Philippines and Indonesia. Investment has to be attracted. It cannot be demanded. And the attraction would be if it's done quickly, if there's a delay, they'll go because their money will take them. Of course, they'll think, they'll feel unstable. You know, they'll feel this instability. And at the end of the day, they are here because they look at India as a credible country. Now, Minister, the problem is that the very concept of SEZs as a vehicle for attracting investment and for creating employment has come to be deeply controversial and deeply criticized. So let me ask you bluntly, after Wednesday's killings in Nandigram, does the government remain cre committed to SEZs or might you use this freeze as a way of politically wriggling out? There's no political wriggling out. It's an act of parliament. Cabinet has considered it. But there is the issue of land acquisition, which must be equitable, must be fair, must be at the right prices, must be inclusive of the people. Nandi Graham was a very unfortunate incident of land acquisition. And we must not confuse land acquisition. You had the Tata car project which was not an SEZ. So don't confuse land acquisition and the problems of land acquisition with the viability of SEZ. Absolutely. They are two so, distinct things. So let me repeat that question. The government therefore remains committed to SEZ. Absolutely. Nandi Gram and political concerns have not put you off. They have not put me off. We need to look at land acquisition. We need to look at rehabilitation. We have to do all that. And the Prime Minister is with you when you say this. He too is committed to SEZ. Well, the Prime Minister made a statement in Parliament uh, a couple of days ago. But that was before Nandi Gram. So once again I'm asking you, after Nandi Gram, the government as a whole is committed. Of course, the government is committed. All right. In that case, let's look at SEZs and let's look at the sort of situation they create. Your secretary in your ministry, G.K. Pillay, has told Outlook magazine that if all 234 proposed SEZs were to go ahead, India would see a 250,000 crore increase in investment, 30 lakh new jobs, and over the next three years, the GDP would increase by 3%. Are those fanciful facts or do you stand by them? It's not fanciful at all. It's a fact. India is emerging as a hub, as a major manufacturing hub. And in this hub, manufacturing for exports is the most important. So SEZs are the engine of growth? SEZs are the engine of growth. They are being established and they are on the ground. In which case, let's they are, look. They are on the ground currently. The problem is that many of your critics dispute those facts and dispute that understanding of SEZs. Let me put to you what they say. To begin with, the Ministry of Finance is letting people know that SEZs over a period of the first four years would incur a loss in revenue of 100,000 crore because of the tax, excise and duty concessions you're giving them. Well, economic activity generates more revenue. I, one can't be more basic than that and this is no rocket science. Number two, when exports are there, you refund your customs uh, and excise duties. Taxes are never exported. So on one hand, if you creatively calculate that I never uh, collected these taxes, not saying that I'm going to refund them, that when they are exported, I'm also refunding them, it gives you a distorted picture. So when the Ministry of Finance says that there will be a loss, they're only giving half the picture, and that's why it's a distorted picture. They're not giving the full picture. Well, uh, the Ministry of Finance has to present their own case, and that's the way they're doing but it. But you dispute it. 
entirely. I believe there is a very major substantial revenue gain and it doesn't take much because any increased economic activity, you're going to create jobs, they're going to create income tax for those people who are going to get those jobs, they're going to become consumers, they're going to pay taxes. So obviously there is an increase in revenue. Not a decrease. Not a decrease. The second criticism made of SE sets is that, in fact, they won't realize the sort of jobs you and your ministry keep saying will be created. They say that 60% of the SEZ proposals you're considering are in the IT sector, which means that they will have minimal, if any, impact on rural employment, where, in fact, the impact is needed. How do you answer that criticism? Well, IT sector has to go where people are available. But SEZs are not about the IT sector alone. SEZs is about manufacturing. SEZs are going to go where they can export, because they are largely meant for exports. So SEZs are not meant necessarily to go to uh, the backward but, right, but do you have enough SEZs in the manufacturing sector to actually give a meaningful boost to employment? Of course. The whole canvas today, if you see of what SEZs in principle approvals are there, formal approvals are there, there are so many German jewellery sector, textile sector, leather sector. The problem here, And they're all coming up. They're on the ground. 50 the, of them the are under construction. The problem here, Minister, is that your own colleague in your ministry, Jairam Ramesh, goes around giving the impression that most of the SEZs are not involved in what he wants them to be involved in, which is labor-intensive units. Instead, he says they are IT-related and they will have a minimal impact. He, in a sense, is giving the wrong impression to people. Well, I don't know what he's doing. I don't think that... Uh, I've ever heard of that. But the fact of the matter, even if it is IT, IT doesn't Let happen. Let me quote to you what he said to Outlook magazine on the 12th of February. They, meaning SEZ, should be a tool for promoting labor-intensive units. It seems that that is not happening, and if that's the case, the policy should be reviewed. That's not correct. Because so he's wrong. There are 50 SEZs on the ground being built. SEZs have started functioning. And they will increase employment? Well, they are on the ground and it's open for everybody to see. And they will increase employment? Well, how can you manufacture without employment? How can you even put up an IT SEZ without employment? So there will be a meaningful impact, not just a marginal impact on employment? Any impact on employment is, is good. And this is going to be meaningful also. In which case, Minister, let's come to what many consider to be the biggest problem with SEZ, the manner in which land is being acquired. Now, I know you made a great point of distinguishing between land acquisition on the one hand and SEZs on the other. But SEZs also require land acquisition, and many states are vol voluntarily stepping in to do it. The problem is that land acquisition is exciting emotion and passion and creating trouble. How do you get around that problem? We need to have a good land acquisition rehabilitation policy. And the Rural Development Ministry, the Rehabilitation Ministry are looking into that. There's no doubt in that, that rehabilitation and land acquisition must be transparent. Let me put it to you like this. Many people say that the only way in which land acquisition will become transparent and overcome the emotional problem is if in addition to giving the dispossessed farmer the market price for his land, you also give him a stake in the development that's going to take place there. Will your government's new rehabilitation and resettlement policy actually make that jump? Well, I think the rehabilitation policy is looking at all these things. And whichever way it happens, whether it happens by a stake, whether it happens by giving him a job, by whatever way, he must necessarily be part and parcel. As I said, land acquisition must be all-inclusive. At Nainital in October, just six months ago, Sonia Gandhi, when she was addressing Congress Chief Minister, said about land acquisition, could farmers also not become stakeholders in the projects that come up on the land acquired from them? Very rightly said. Do you think your new resettlement and rehabilitation policy will make that happen? It will not be my policy, but my government's but policy. But will it make it happen? Well, th this is for the rehabilitation ministry and the rural development ministry to work but at are you it. Pushing I, would I would fully support it. You're pushing for it? Of course I would fully support it. And so you're confident that, in fact, this will be the end outcome? Of course, it must happen, and I think that's the right thing to do. Let me put one last thing to you. Speaking in the Lok Sabha on the 8th of March, the Prime Minister said, and I quote, if we have made any mistake we will make necessary corrections. Now, many people say, looking at the SEZ policy, that there is one serious lacuna. You haven't given SEZs the permission or the power for labor law flexibility. Can you correct that at this stage, or is it too late? Well, we haven't provided that in the SEZ Act. It should not be provided in the SEZ Act. You wanted to? No. We thought we, we wanted to give the state governments the freedom. That's right. Okay. Now, the state governments still have that freedom. The state government still have the... Under the act you passed? Not under the act I passed, but under the Labour Act, because a lot of the state, some of the state governments have even asked for it. 
So what they, some saying, of the state governments have written to us asking for it. So what you're saying, and I'm interrupting you, is that it may not be in the act in the way we wanted to do it or thought we could do it, but it is still available to state governments to do. In other words, those state governments that believe their respective SEZ should have a higher and fire policy can give them that liberty. Not the, on the basis, not on everything of all the labor laws. There are various types of labor but laws. But they can make it less rigid. They can make it more attuned to the specifics of that area. Now, we must understand a new thing which is happening, and I must say it. There is a competitive atmosphere within states. States want to draw investment. Whatever they think is in the interest of the state, well, they will obviously want to do it. So as states compete with each other to attract investment, and as they compete to make their SEZs more attractive, they have the room to make labor laws less rigid and more attractive. Well, they, they have asked for it, and the government, central government has not as yet responded to it. And I think this is something which will come up by the, the chief ministers themselves will take it up in the next chief minister's meeting. But your meeting. vote as an individual minister would be give them that if they want it. Well, I would say this. One side is employment protection, the other side is employment generation. A, we need to create a balance. Absolutely. But create a balance that attracts investment, Absol not support investment. Of. Absolutely. And so if the states are asking for it, consider giving it to them. Well, it depends what kind of relaxation. Absolutely. They, of but course, I would consider it. You would consider it. I would consider it. On that note, let's take a break and let's come back and talk about what sort of permission can you give to FDI and to large corporate houses to enter the retail sector in India. That's the subject in a moment's time. See you after the break. Welcome back to Devil's Advocate and an interview with Industry and Commerce Minister Kamalath. Minister, let's turn to whether FDI or large corporate houses should be permitted to enter the retail sector in India. You've commissioned a study from ICRIAR on the impact this would have. People say you've chosen the wrong organization because two years ago they produced a study to say that in fact FDI in retail would have no real meaningful impact on small retailers. Have you chosen a partisan group to do the study? I think ICRIAR is very credible. And this time we've given them a much more holistic view. It's not FDI. It is whether large retail by the big houses. How does it impact the small players? Does it sort of dislocate them? Uh, what is the impact of it? And you it? think it could and, and, and we've also put there in the, what is in the interest of the consumer. Quite right. We've also put there uh, what does it do to the economy. Quite right. And you think ICRIA is the right body to do this? Well, they it's are not party free. It's not prejudiced. I don't think ICRIA has got uh, ICRIA has got a lot of credibility. There are reports in newspapers that the Prime Minister's office has assured traders that, in fact, the Department of Industrial Policy and Promotion will conduct a separate independent study. Is that confirmed? Well, it is my department, which is the Department of uh, DIPP, which has commissioned ICRIA. So this is not a separate study. No. The reports that suggest there's a separate study are in fact therefore wrong. Absolutely. Now, many people say that Kamal Nath as minister is very keen to open the retail sector both to FDI and to large Indian domestic corporate houses. But Sonia Gandhi and the Prime Minister are a lot more cautious. Are the two of you operating on different wavelengths? Not at all. I've always said and I maintain that no FDI in retail should dislocate. Uh, the small retailer. It should be incremental. It should be incremental. It should create more jobs. But are you pushing for it at a faster pace than, say, Sonia Gandhi and the Prime Minister want I, to push? I don't think so because we have not opened it up. And where it's the question of large and small, I'm, my ministry is not concerned with it. It's the Ministry of Consumer Affairs. So there are no differences either in principle or in practice not between you and Sonia Gandhi and the PM? Absolutely. None whatsoever? Because none have been opened up. In which case, let's look for a moment at what the study you've commissioned may throw up, and let's begin by talking about it in terms of how it would affect large corporate houses. Many people believe that the study could suggest that the entry of large corporate houses into, F into retail could have a damaging impact, an adverse impact on small retailers. If that were to be the case, would you move to shut down the Reliance outlets that have just opened up? Well, I don't believe that can be the case because, number one, there is, we are having 25 million people coming to the middle class. We are having a 9.2% growth with people coming in with more purchasing power. We need more retail. The question is the additional retail which the country needs. How will it come? Will it come in the organized sector or will it come in the unorganized sector? So the sector? reliance outlets that have already started are perfectly safe regardless of what outcome the study throws up. Well, there is space for everybody. And I believe, now that's what, why we've commissioned the study, because I could be wrong. Let's I'm not saying I'm right. Let's pause for a moment. What's perhaps more likely is the study will suggest 
side by side by pointing out that there could be an adverse impact for small retailers, it might also suggest that the entry of large corporates into retail would have a huge beneficial effect for consumers and suppliers. If you get that sort of split verdict, which half of the findings would you give greater priority to? Well, we've got to harmonize this. There has to be a balance. And on one hand, we, while we need to ensure the interest of the consumer, on the other hand, we've got to ensure that it doesn't lead to such displacement which causes unemployment. Except, but I believe... Can I point something out? More Indians are consumers than happen to be small retailers. Why shouldn't you give preference to the consumer interest rather than to the small lobby of small retailers? Well, I think consumer has many choices. But retailer may not have another choice. A consumer can still get his stuff, whether he gets it from the big or the small. So you have to be politically careful here. It's not politically careful. You've got to see that at the end of the day, it's incremental. What about then the impact of FDI in retail? Do you believe that the impact of FDI would be both qualitatively and quantitatively different to the impact of large domestic corporate houses? Well, I don't think it's ever a question of FDI in retail. Always the question is big versus small. Can I interrupt? The reason why people make a distinction is they say, look at Walmart. It has a turnover of 250 billion. It has profits of 10 billion a year. It's 15 times larger than Reliance, which is why Kishor Biani the managing director of the Future Group says, and I quote, in terms of size, Walmart is bigger than the total consumption in India. Once it is able to bring its own equity, it can manipulate the markets on its terms and conditions. Does that sort of fear worry you? Well, Walmart is, uh, of course, very large. We have not allowed them in retail. We have not allowed Walmart. As yet? We have not allowed them. And but I is this an argument for putting them off forever? No, or no, is this an argument I have for being always careful? said that if... FDI and retail, which I believe will upset the small uh, retailer. We need to strengthen the small retailer. That's why I said, if they want to come in, they should go to the back end. They should invest in packaging. They should invest in technology. As Bharti is bringing them in. Well, I do not know because Bharti has not filed an application as yet. No, but as the press reports, they're coming in at the back end. They're not at the front end. They're not going to be involved in retail. Well, They'll be involved in cash and carry. If and wholesale. Walmart supplies to every retailer good food products, 40% rot, if they put up a cold chain, if they put up packaging, if they put up preservation and supply to every retailer, it strengthens my retailer. Let me point out one other thing. Business Line in April 2005 quoted a series of surveys which suggested that if international retailers were to control 20% of the Indian retail market, 8 million jobs could be lost. Now some people say that's a serious concern. Others say, what do those facts come from? What are they based upon? They're cooked up. What's your view? Do you take them seriously or do you say those statistics are cooked up? Well, I believe that uh, uh, there is going to be dislocation. But whether it's 8 million or not, I can't say. And I don't know what Business Line says. But to me, it appears that entry of these players is going to close down because their ability to, to, to take a loss, their ability to stand, their ability to, you know, to stock is much more than the small retailer. And if they want to put their money in, I want them to put their money where it strengthens my small retailer. So are you saying then that in fact there will be dislocation, but despite that we must be open-minded about FDI because we need it? Or are you saying that dislocation must put us off letting FDI in? That the possible dislocation which can occur leads me to think that they must put their money where we need it. We, they must bring their technology where we need it, and that's the back end. So they come in on our terms rather than theirs? Of course, India is a large market. And, and you're confident you can persuade them to do that? Well, I hope, so. I hope so, because the number of small retailers there are is uh, the number of, uh, in fact, customers they have in other countries. So when it comes to FDI as opposed to large corporate houses, the small retailer gets your first preference? The small retailer gets my first preference. Kamanath, a pleasure talking to you on Devil's Advocate.